Well, consumers have certainly latched on to the term regenerative agriculture. You know, whether they fully understand it or not, or even given it the old sniff test to see whether New Zealand products are already regenerative, it's certainly causing a stir in the New Zealand primary sector, uh, from soil scientists all the way through to marketers. But of course, our consumers are paying attention to where their food is coming from and the rise of food insecurity uh, post-COVID-19. And in his latest uh, opinion piece in Farmers Weekly this week, Rob Hewitt, uh, co-chair of Silverfern Farms and chair of Farmlands, as well as sheep and beef farmer himself, uh, has written his thoughts on why we need to be paying attention to this and joins us now in studio. Thanks for so much. Um, what d- drove you to get to the point of taking pen to paper on this particular topic? Uh, it's sort of been... COVID-19 has given us lots of time to reflect when we were on lockdown on the farm and uh, and you, you really uh, highlighted it in your intro actually. I mean it, it, it's become obvious to me and I think to many that uh, the consumers who were quite complacent in where their food came from mm. have suddenly realised a couple of things. Firstly they didn't have a relationship with their food producers so they were, were, were taking it at face value that the food that they ate was safe and verifiably safe and uh, and when COVID came along and disrupted that supply chain, all of a sudden I thought, oh, perhaps I'd better get, get a bit more engaged in this. Uh, so that's the first point. They are looking for a relationship. And then look, to be fair, with regard to New Zealand producers of food and New Zealand consumers, the assumption that food is safe, I think, is fair enough. And, uh, and sacrosanct, I think, but uh, not necessarily the case when you go out into the into the big wide world. So that, that would be the first point. The second point is that... Um, Consumers for a while have been, uh, particularly offshore, have been concerned about the safety of their food. Um, and it's it's just reached uh, quite quickly, I think, a tipping point or it's approaching a tipping point around. And that's where, where this all came from. You know, Regen, when, when you're offshore, uh, my view is that consumers of our food see New Zealand as being largely regenerative in its, its pastoral agricultural processes right now. You know, and, and indeed, when you look at regen and, and what they're espousing around around preserving preservation of soil, multiple species in a sward, rotational grazing, you know, intervals returning back to to paddocks, you know, that's largely what a lot of us are doing as as sheep and beef and dairy farmers today. Mm-hmm. So, so the whole thesis behind this was really, how can New Zealand position itself in the eyes of the world to give the consumers in the world the food that they're looking for by just more clearly articulating what we're doing today. And that is the point I think you make and many make around this debate is uh, there is no ability to tick a box. And we're so used to in this industry being given guidelines and standard minimum standards to adhere to, uh, to for access to supply to these markets. And of course, silver firm farms have a lot of those programs. So how are we going to understand what is regenerative already and what is not? Because uh, there's a lot of things you mentioned in here that New Zealand do do, monocultural cropping, artificial fertilisers and we don't herbicides. Do those. <laughs> we don't do those. And, uh, and uh, you know, when I'm talking monoculture, multiple cropping, soy, uh, uh, maize cropping at scale offshore, that's absolutely monocultural. And, and you know, you need the herbicides and fertiliser applications to, to keep up with that. And you're in a bit of a downward spiral when you get to that point. Um, You know, I I think New Zealand hasn't quite got to that point yet, and and largely that's by accident of of um, of the 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 amount of rain and the the fertility of the natural fertility of the land that we've got. Uh, Grass-based pastures, uh, farming systems around the world is quite uncommon. We we think it isn't because we're in the middle of it. Uh, But really, at scale, when you go globally, the only countries that can do this consistently are ourselves and Ireland. Mm. You look you look anywhere else, uh, they can do it. The States, Canada, Australia, South America, South Africa, they can do it for parts of the year for a period of time, but but they can't do it consistently Mm. like we Mm. can. And that's what consumers are looking for. They're looking for um, what they perceive to be healthy farming systems and they look you know if 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 people have visited new zealand Mm. they see new zealand largely delivering what they what they assess regenerative to be because quite frankly not many consumers understand what regen is no of course not so why are we fighting over it here at home i think it's the uncertainty and and that's part of the definition issue because if you can't measure it you can't quantify it Mm. if you can't quantify it you can't manage to it 
And and the opportunity that we've got in New Zealand at the moment, in my view, is that we can define this in our image, in our own, you know, you take the natural opportunities that we have in our systems already mm. that are already effectively regenerative, add to it where we don't, and that's the, the question mark is, is, is what is that, and that's what the definition is about. And we can make informed decisions about, well, do we want to go down that path or not? But let's take the best bits of both and put it together because we're doing it largely now anyway. What are some of the benefits of where we can lift the bottom up into being more regenerative, and particularly around soil <coughs> erosion, and of course also uh, our protection for ongoing droughts in terms of soil water holding capacity and things like that as well? Yeah, well, I mean, Gen quite you know quite sensibly in my view talk a lot about you know single pass tillage you know direct drilling I mean, I've used direct drills for for, for years on my mm. farm and uh, for part of my um, my farming system not entirely mm. uh, you know but but I guess a quid pro quo with that is uh, glyphosate you know I, I do use glyphosate on my and farm and so do regenerative farmers yeah and you know and yet it's held up around the world as being a um, mm. Was it Monsanto or DuPont? I can't remember. One of the big companies just recently has, has settled a $16 billion claim, I think, for glypho use offshore. Uh, the reason being it's cheaper to stay out of court. I think that's completely the wrong reason. I can understand their pragmatism, but at the end of the day, it doesn't set a good scene for the rest of the, uh, the globe if glypho has a place to play. And under Regen, I think it still does have a place to play if used appropriately, as does artificial fertilisers if used appropriately. And and that's that's the challenge. So therefore, we have had such an output-based um, auditing system with Overseer, and this freshwater management is very largely input-focused uh, in regards to things like nitrogen cap. The farmers who are trialling parts of regenerative agriculture are motivated by these higher standards to make, make sure that they're improving water quality and, and soil um, runoff and sediment and things like that to meet simple regional council. If the method to the to their madness to achieving the regulatory standards is parts of regen, then then why should we care and if it's in terms of enhancing their farming system that they know intimately well, why does the regenerative have to be a threat? It's not. Yeah, so in terms point. of your mis- that's my point. this is your point in the opinion piece. Yes, <laughs> yeah. so no, this exactly. Is a, look, there aren't, I have never experienced an opportunity where consumers are saying, we want what you have got. Yes. We have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to package it up in a way that they are looking for to premiumise it. Right. And, and that is the free pass. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay, so that's the point as well, is package it up to free, uh, premiumise it, is your words, and the frustration is that, but we can't define it. So, Damien O'Connor said last week, uh, about the controversy I put to him around his regenerative mindset in the framework, the fit for a better world. And he said, well, why do we have to call it regen? Why can't we call our farming systems te tile? What do you yeah. make from this uh, roadmap that was released last week? Oh, I like it. I've had a, bit, a little bit to do with it on the periphery. Um, but from a commercial perspective, I think it's really great. Uh, it, it, that is, effectively, that's New Zealand's regenerative standard, it, it, in part. I mean, it's wider than that. But as I said earlier, when you go around the world, the only the only two countries I think that do pastoral livestock production sustainably and consistently is Ireland and New Zealand. Ireland already has uh, their Project Green and uh, or Origin Green, and uh, and Tataiao is our equivalent. Now, what Tataiao allows us to do is to package up what New Zealand does really, really well, but with the unique New Zealandness of that. This is not a Project Green Me Too. This is more than that. This is New Zealand's opportunity to market its food as a unified sector to the world, and I think that's incredibly positive. Um, it's not going to fly in the face of any of the programs that Silverfern Farms or Alliance or Fonterra or whoever else is marketing the food to the world uh, is currently doing. The two can coexist together. And the way I see to tie out, it's a, it's a standard that goes across the entire sector. Mm. Any of the individual programs that the companies do by themselves sits on top. So mm. it's like an and rather than an or. Uh, but very clearly, I think consumers, and, and, and with regard to to tie out, that helps us start to set the standards. We, we need to, the industry needs to take responsibility for this. And we need to set our standards because if we don't, we will have them set for us. And... My experience is that when you have standards set for you, 
They tend not to be uh, in the scalable, achievable, at a level that you would have done yourself. And quite frankly, our consumers aren't looking for a purest level of regenerative farming either. They're looking for what they consider to be regen, and quite frankly, I don't think they really know. So we need to tell them what it is in our image, Mm -hmm. backed by Tataia, uh, as an as an industry food and fibre standard for New Zealand and market it to the world. I think it's a huge opportunity. Okay, so there's a lot of arguments around um, how we can put a scientific framework, and I understand MPI uh, are looking to support funding into that framework for regenerative agriculture in New Zealand. Do you think uh, this will be an opportunity for everybody to come together to form what that minimum standard is of accreditation, so. as so. opposed to fighting against each other? It needs to be. And that's going to be the challenge, you know. We've we've got to we've all got to work together on this. And there's a relatively, you know, there's a window of opportunity here that we need to take advantage of. Uh, it would be in the industry's best interest to work together on this, rather than so the food and fibre section sector needs to work together on this, because if we have regenerative farmers uh, with with a very pure view of the world, and we have high intensity systems farmers in the dairy sector with their view of the world and they don't talk to each other, we're not gonna get any change. Mm. And in the meantime, two years down the track, the world's moved on and Mm. we haven't taken the opportunity out of it. All right. We've talked about this before with regards to uh, you wanting to see a premium attached to some of our ground beef that goes in uh, to leaning out um, some of those US beef yeah. patties. <laughs> and there is always going to be that commodity market for the, what doesn't meet that standard. Do we define premium uh, double and quadruple over commodity to incentivise a bigger enough change, do you believe? Look, I, and the other point yeah. is around um, that access to supply and Fonterra's uh, obligation under DIRA still not clarified um, and, and so therefore and you have a boomer crop harvest like avocados we have to get rid of them somewhere so how do we do both? Well I mean it happened in the wine industry a few years ago in Bledham when there was a, a huge glut of Sauvignon Blanc and it got to the stage I remember it very well because I was doing some consultancy work in the Australian Liquor Channel at that stage and uh, and the the decision point came down to do I as a as a wine industry do I sell my complete harvest to Woolworths in Australia, and they'll private label it to for price points from four dollars a bottle to twenty dollars a bottle. It's the same juice, same juice. So work that out. Or do I tip it into the town's um, sewage system? Because by doing that, I know I'm going to I'm going to cut my nose off uh, short term, but I'm going to preserve the brand value of Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand. Now, as it eventuated, neither of those two things happened, but they were sort of the two extremes. And my, my point really is, do you, at the end of the day, what we do with our pastoral systems, we are, we are producing, my favourite saying, we are producing Mercedes cars here. It's the equivalent of that. This is top end stuff that we do. Around the world, we're going to have many, many consumers that we'll never be able to afford our product. And quite frankly, we're wasting our time marketing to them because they will always go after cheaper stuff. It's all about price. But we have a distinct segment and that segment is growing and they want our product. We need to make sure that we market our Mercedes at Mercedes prices. Now, if we act in a commodity fashion, we're in danger of never quite getting there. Having said that, you know, I, I know for a fact that our commodity 95 CL beef does attract a premium around the world. And the reason it does that is because it's got a very tight specification Mm. that allows that confidence from the manufacturer that they are putting good quality product into their burger patties. Now, this provides an opportunity to extend that a bit further. The answer to your question really is it's horses for courses, because for some items like commodities, there'll be an opportunity to perhaps get a small premium above where we are today. For other branded product, and we don't do enough of that in my Mm. view, um, there's a huge opportunity. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a bit, it'll be a mix and a match depending on what the cut is, what the market is. But ultimately, I think, you know, when you're benchmarking against current performance, anything in, in, a, uh, in addition to that has got to be a good place to start. Mm, and we do uh, have a shelf life on these products as opposed to a Mercedes as well for the aspirational type element in terms of moving stock throughput, especially within the livestock game with um, climatic pressures and conditions of that yeah, as well. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, I'm sure the Mercedes guys will argue that a 1974 SL Mercedes is probably not the same as a, a 2021 SL Mercedes, uh, so they'll argue shelf life too. What I'm really saying is yeah. we aren't selling daywoos here, guys. 
Yeah. And but we're, too often the the whole industry has been caught up with the idea of we've got to get this product gone, so we'll drop our pants on price, and that just buggers any opportunity to premium my stuff next year. Mm. Yeah, you know, we've got we've got customers sitting offshore. I've seen this supermarkets in Europe that will sit there like piranhas at the bottom of the waterfall, or in the in the in the drinking pond, waiting for the zebra to step in because they know every year New Zealand producers are going to stump up in March. There's a glut of product and the mm. price just tanks. Why don't we get away from it? We're that? too predictable. Yeah, well, it's seasonal. We're on a pastoral grass curve. That's not going to change. But how do we premiumize other aspects around it, around our farming systems, around the way that we do business, around the way that we manage our animals and manage the, the welfare of them? Package it all up. Do you know what I'd like to see? Scarcity bring, being brought into the mm. play of marketing and why do we have to supply lamb year round? Oh, look, I, I, I agree. <laughs> I think there's, uh, there's, there's significant opportunity. Uh, as long as the demand pulls it through, so this has mm. got to be consumer-led, but if demand pulls it through, there is no reason that New Zealand lamb or beef cannot occupy the same space that bluff oysters do here. It, there, there is no reason for it. But mm-hmm. we do have to grow demand ahead of supply. Mm. And that's one thing that Zespri has done extremely well with gold kiwi fruit, mm. is limit the amount of licenses that are available so that they can keep a, keep a track of supply and make sure that their demand um, forecast through their promotional programs and, and marketing calendar yeah. uh, has got more more in it than the ability to fill it. All right, rather than a minimum standard pan sector, can we make Taitaiao an aspirational licence license like Zespri and the fact that your farm gets Taitaiao approved to supply, therefore disregarding what makeup you want of product on that and you're not sitting under a silo. So if you want to have a mixed multi land use system, regardless of what you change and who you supply to, you're a Taitaiao licensed property. Yep. There we go. Why not? Okay, we're going to send this on to Lane Jager and Damien. Uh, he's already thought of it. Yeah. <laughs> there no, we go. Of course that's he is. Ab- that's absolutely true. That's where it needs to be. Absolutely. It's a standard. There we go. Yeah. Of course he A is. minimum standard. Yes. Ultimately. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it's aspirational for those um, farmers as well and that feel-good element as well, that mm. they've achieved that particular mm. accreditation. Mm. Uh, now, I'd absolutely love to end this on your line about we must be both consumer-led and science-based. Do you believe that we've been either one or the other in our thinking? Um, look, we've, we've it's sort of both and neither, uh, really. I, I guess where we have been, uh, and I'm talking production, uh, livestock, pastoral livestock production here, but it's true, and, 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 and that's either milk or meat. I think really where our focus over the last forever has been production driven. We've been throughput driven. It's about how do I extract more value from my land, and by and large, that's been about producing more, more widgets. Uh, that's not consumer led. And to be fair, when I, when I think about cooperatives owned by the farmers, they have actually caused half of this issue because cooperatives have been, when I think about the meat game, it's been all about how do I take the volume of livestock that's being provided to me by my shareholders, I'll worry about selling it later on. Right now I need to process it. So it has driven a throughput mentality, a volume mentality, which is not about product differentiation, it is not about brand, it is all about deal with today, not tomorrow. And in my view, you know, we've, we've got to take our responsibility for that and, and, and look to change it. So I think the industry is getting more consumer led, but we've got a long way to go, a hugely long way to go. Lever, Unilever or um, all of those branded FMCG companies around the world will look at what we're trying to do and laugh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're, we're one set of very limited SKUs uh, and we really just started down this journey and the investment that we put into it is minuscule compared to them. So have we been science based? Yep, on on the uh, everything that we do to support that production throughput driven mentality. I think under Regen, the two can sit together. Uh, I, I listen to what some of our scientists and, and uh, whether they're soil scientists or animal scientists, what they're saying about Regen, and I look at what the Regen guys are saying, and I think we're arguing both sides of the same coin actually. Mm. There is no question in my mind, however, that we need to listen to our consumers and ultimately they will pay the premium that we deserve. Uh, there may be a bit of a, a gap between their their willingness to pay and our ability to supply, and it's a bit of a leap of faith, but we've never been in a better space to actually take advantage of that right now because they're looking for our food. They want our systems. They understand, well, they think they understand what Regen is. 
they like it. Mm. They haven't thought about it too hard, but it sounds like when the world was a less complex place than it is today, mm. and New Zealand looks like that place. Mm. When they go to their happy place, that's probably... New Zealand looks like a happy place. Oh, what a lovely way to end it. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your opinion piece from Farmers Weekly this week, Rob Hewitt. This is Sarah's Country.